To everybody who said, and even more to everybody who thought, gee, this is a very Eurocentric discussion. You should stop doing this. Now is the time when we stop doing this. Mishy said quite correctly earlier in the afternoon that lots of people don't live here. In fact, the majority of the human race lives elsewhere. That's certainly right. But that's not the only reason that thinking about FOSS from an Asian perspective is now required by, you know, it's more than demographic gravity. It's more than the question, what is the driver of the global economy? It's that we are watching in real time as the world trade system is being disrupted in the western edge of the Pacific Rim even more than here in very dangerous and complicated ways and FOSS is caught in the middle of it. It doesn't matter where you live in the world. The fate of FOSS in Asia in the societies that build and serve and contain all of that part of the human race, the fate of FOSS in Asia is the fate of freedom in the world. So in taking an Asianist perspective on the subject, we may, of course, be doing some violence to our normal assumption that English is the most important language and that here is the most important place. But we are beginning to get to the central concerns that both the FOSS ecology in business and the free software movement have to address. Uh, among the three panelists we have here, we are, um, well, I am privileged to have been able to convince the people I most wanted in the world to be here. One, it is true, as my law partner, she has fewer choices. Um, uh, but, 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 but this, for me, is also a sign of what it means to have spent your life well because you have met good people. Maggie Wang and I met in Shenzhen because Huawei and SFLC began to have a relationship with one another at the beginning of this decade. And Maggie was the lawyer at Huawei who was capable of helping me to understand what was really going on around me as I began to deal with this new company for the first time. <laughs> Um, Maggie then went on to translate uh, for us the SFLC compliance guide for copyleft licensing and GPL3 and became our linguistic and cultural lifeline to the enormous WeChat community of Chinese IP lawyers that I would never have been able to reach without her. Kiryong Song, on the other hand, well, that's the beauty of being a law professor. Kiryong turned up in my law school class because he came to take an LLM at Columbia Law School, and um, eventually we decided we ought to do something together in Korea. So I said to him, go learn some stuff about FOSS in Korea and let's see what happens. And next thing I knew, he had got us a whole lot of opportunity to learn and even to do a little business and to understand the state of the FOSS world in Korea, let us say, five years ago. So here are two people I was fortunate to meet, expert in the things that you would like us all to learn about and stop being so ethnocentric that we can't hear. The very best bunch that I could possibly offer for a beginning of the conversation we're all going to have a lot of to follow. Maggie, do you want to begin? Shall we start with the Chinese situation? Okay, sure. I thought I, I'm the last one. Okay. Ah, uh, but you have slides. And so I do. We yeah. should take advantage of them. Okay. Should I? I'll, I'll be here. Okay. Uh, okay. So b before I s uh, start, I have to... Uh, let you know that maybe some of you don't know that in China we don't have Facebook, we don't have Twitter, we don't even act, have access to uh, Google or even Wikipedia. So my talk is biased <laughs> uh, in some way. Okay, but I try to give uh, some um, uh, ideas about China and I try to uh, I, I try to talk from uh, you know another 
uh, not from my personal view, but I try to give some uh, day data to show you the whole picture of China in Foss area. Uh, first, this is a photo of Chinese family having meal together. Um, I want to say that China has always had this custom, uh, custom for sharing and uh, open source is all about sharing and, and I think um, uh, the way of people eating is very important. Um, it affects how you do things. Uh, this is a friend of mine, um, Mr. Uh, Cui Baoqiu. Um, He's uh, the, ch the chief architect at Xiaomi Technology, a phone company. So um, th this is, uh, he, he personally uh, sent me a message about this last year. So he says, the power of open source coming from China is getting tremendously stronger in the fields of cloud computing and big data, as well as AI. Um, so I think um, even if we are, um, we don't have all the access we can have, uh, we still uh, are a part of the technology innovation in the world. Uh, this is uh, data from a report by, um, by Kai Yuan She. Kai Yuan She is a um, c community in China, uh, which is a very, uh, active in recent years, and tomorrow, or, or maybe today, in, in the evening, the, uh, there's a conference called CosCon. It's going to start in uh, Shanghai, China, uh, which is held by uh, Kai Yuan She. And I asked uh, Eben to give a one-minute uh, speech, and I took a video of him. This video will be shown in the conference. Um, this is the GitStar ranking. Uh, I tracked the, uh, th this ranking from last year. You can see that Alibaba uh, was uh, ranked number eight last year and now it's number five. And Tencent is in the top 10 list. Uh, Spark committee, co committers, you can see that more uh, Chinese developers are on the list. Um, even um, well, the there there are uh, even some um, Chinese names with the uh, 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 non-Chinese companies. You can see uh, oil and license fees are growing in China as well. Uh, last year, and financial Alibaba joined, and I think this year more companies joined uh, OIN. Mm. Uh, I think this uh, is a way to look at the technical side of uh, the country because more uh, companies are uh, open to the outside world. Uh, sponsorship with major foundations, you will see the names of Huawei, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, all the major players in the technical field. and. Uh, uh, organizations in China that attract attentions. Uh, Kai Yuan She is the most active. Also, there are some WeChat official accounts uh, which are uh, sponsored by uh, different companies or, which, or some of them are uh, individual accounts. Um, from the legal side, uh, lawsuits in China um, about open source is um, just uh, non-existent, basically. Uh, there uh, was a case that people got uh, aware of because it mentioned GPL, but it was just uh, um, used as uh, a, a defense to uh, to just to I think to differentiate what what is the proprietary software, what is uh, open source, it's not really enforcing rights in GPL. So the open source is used basically as a defense for identifying copyright ownership or trade secret. 
and no case is found to claim rights in open source software. And there are some other cases mentioning open source, but um, not really relative to claiming rights in open source. Uh, there is one case that relates to trade secret leak in open source community. So some guy who left a company uh, and he published uh, the, mm, the company's uh, tr tr trade secret in GitHub. So that's another case. Uh, and not, uh, well, this is a photo we took last month at Huawei. It was a joint event by Huawei and uh, uh, Open, Open Chain uh, project. You, you, you can see Shane in the photo, and you can see um, Keith at the end of the table. Uh, so we uh, basically invited all the major companies in Shenzhen. Um, also, um, companies like Baidu, Alibaba send people here. So um, this is an in-house meeting. It was very well received and uh, um, I gave a speech about um, in-house management of open source software. Um, well, I had the feeling that um, Almost every technical company uh, started to realize open source was very important to them. And some of them were uh, trying to be compliant and some of them uh, already started to uh, contribute to the community and they wanted to do more. Um, uh, these are the uh, an important, the recent issues that also caught China's attention. Um, everything we talked about today, um, uh, please be, be aware that in China we know about that as well, um, especially uh, you know, in the uh, legal, le uh, <laughs> legal field. Um, um, actually, I have something here I want to talk about. Um, Well, I learned a lot this uh, today. Uh, so I, I think this in China, um, we really need to collaborate with the, the outside world. Um, and uh, it seems that there is um, uh, no, uh, you know, no nonprofit organizations. Uh, really active in China. I know OIN and Linux Foundation um, did a lot of work uh, in China. They, they sponsored some meetings uh, and those were really nice and the uh, uh, Chinese companies really need that. I just, well, I, I met these fa fantastic people here Today, I just wish that we could have access to all these professionals in China, but we don't. So um, I don't know how we can deal with this, but I believe that uh, with the, uh, the development of uh, uh, those companies, when they realize that uh, open source compliance and contribution are getting more and more important. They will send people uh, to uh, uh, important meetings like this or to Japan and there will be a summit uh, in December. Um, I think really we, we need collaboration. Uh, so to summarize, uh, I think Chinese companies start to shift from compliance to contribution. Legal risk is ve still very low, um, but, but people do realize that licenses are important. Uh, compliance awareness is improving. As, as I get all the questions, and uh, I, I, cause, uh, because I worked at Huawei, uh, and people know that I had experience in dealing with compliance and the, uh, uh, some other companies uh, later uh, found me and they asked me all sorts of questions. And I go to uh, different companies to talk about open source as well. Uh, 
and so I, I think uh, really compliance awareness is, in, is improving in re recent years. Uh, and supply chains are gradually requiring compliance because uh, even if a company, he doesn't know about it, his, he probably, the company probably has uh, clients who require compliance, so they gradually have to follow rules. Um, so that's all I, I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Song. Uh, my first name is Kiryong, but everyone called me Song when I was here, so I prefer to just be called Song. Uh, when you can't think of it, just uh, think about singing a song, then I'll pop up. Uh, the issue that I was asked to uh, analyze and explain was uh, the current situation of Korean FOSS, and based on that uh, analyzation, uh, to give a forecast of Korean FOSS, uh, in the future. So I prepared some slides. The contents is going to be first, as usual, like a brief uh, explanation of my firm, but I'm going to make it very brief. And as the uh, content says, the past and present situation, and then the future prediction. But between, I want to give a Korean unique situation, which is going to like help you understand why Koreans are uh, thinking in which way, and in a certain way. And then the conclusion. Okay, uh, my firm is the second largest one in Korea. We deal with all sorts of uh, legal matters that happens in Korea, so uh, whenever any legal issues, if you encounter, just uh, sing the song. Yeah. Second, uh, in my firm, uh, there's a team called Open Source Software Team. We're composed of nine, uh, we call them uh, experts, which are four partner attorneys, two associates, and three advisors like me. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, like we're uh, working together as a team. It depends on the task or case, which case falls into which partner and who uh, gets involved. So I'll just make it that brief. The uh, Second part is the past and present situation of Korea. Uh, what I want to explain is uh, in Korea, you have to, uh, it's going to be easier for you to understand the, if you split it to public and private sectors. In public sector, uh, of course, the government. And in Korea, it's a unique situation which the government has a very strong role in FOSS also, like every other sector in Korea. And up to this point, uh, as you know, uh, Microsoft is very successful in Korea. Like over 80% of the PCs are uh, run by Microsoft Windows. And technological dependency is always uh, like a problem from our viewpoint uh, that we're too dependent on what we call the foreign uh, technology. And in the private sector, as you know, uh, we have uh, global manufacturers like Samsung, LG, and SK. And at the same time, we have a lot of middle and small size <coughs> uh, companies which, uh, which are always wondering what Samsung is doing. And our, in Korea, up to this point, the actual problem regarding open source is license problem, how uh, we're going to be compliant. That was the, uh, and is the biggest issue up to this point. Oh, sorry. So I, wanna, uh, I want to explain the uh, uniqueness of the Korean culture first. Uh, there is a we culture. And in this we, it's not just doing the project together. It has to be pure Korean. And if it's not made purely by a Korean company, it's not regarded to be as inside the we groups. So that's a starting point. So it, 
it comes down to is it, is it Korean or foreign? So I, I don't want to say localization. That's uh, too weak a word. You, uh, we have to say Koreanization. It has to be made inside Korea. That's what we, uh, the Koreans regard, or we Koreans regard as uh, truly Korean or uh, made inside or localized. So the Korean uniqueness based on this, the government has the lead. It always has the lead. Uh, in the past, this uh, government leadership uh, made it possible to uh, made it possible for Korea to like, build up its economy in a very short time. And in Korea, like uh, the minist there's a ministry, there's a department called Ministry of Science and ICT, which uh, has a budget of 510 billion USD uh, a year uh, for a year, and then. Underneath it, there is a NIPA, National IT Promotion Agency, which spends 360, more than 360 million a year just in promoting uh, IT businesses. And <clears throat> especially for FOSS, there's Open Source Software Competency Plaza, which spends uh, over $12 million just to uh, promote open source. And uh, my firm is working with this uh, open source software company Competency Plaza. Uh, we worked last year, we're working this year, and we're uh, expected to work next year too. And also, uh, there's another uh, government branch uh, and another government organization called uh, KCC, Korean Copyright Commission. When I was at SFLC, we used to work together with uh, KCC, and they also spent over millions of dollars just to uh, promote open source uh, compliance and governance. And at the same time, I want to, uh, not only the government side, but on the private sector, I want to uh, say it coexists, uh, companies and complexes, uh, which the government and private companies are combined together. Uh, the glo global players and mid-size and small-size players, they're all in the same IT market, and they're competing against each other. And most of the small-size ones are sort of subordinate to the uh, conglom conglomerates, uh, Samsung and uh, LG, and they have a huge influence over the little size IT companies. And <clears throat> the one of the unique uh, unique thing in Korea is there are government built IT complexes. For example, there's uh, G Valley, which stands for Kuro, which is the uh, area name, and also the V Valley, the Venture Valley, and there are over. 30,000 IT companies in these two uh, areas alone. So Korean, Korean government is building up these IT uh, complexes and giving a lot of benefits to the IT companies which go in there and like, for example, tax exemptions or other uh, like export uh, subsidiaries and so on. But what I want to emphasize is uh, Open source in, the, in other countries are sort of uh, done in the private sector, not government-led. But uh, in Korea, the government is very uh, like emphasizing the need of open source also, like the private sector. And among the private sector, there's an organization called COSA, Korean Open Source Software Association. And over 150 open source companies are uh, inside and a member of this uh, association. Samsung is a member of this association and a lot of little size uh, companies are also member of this. They do uh, open source support, which means compliance support, governance support. They do open source education. Uh, last year and this year, they gathered up about uh, 30 uh, programmers from 30 companies, and then they sent them to uh, Boston, FSF, and other places to do the actual field trip and go back and get motivated and get some other, like, uh, more uh, positive influences and, like, do more open source activities when they go back to Korea. And uh, this uh, COSA is a kind of uh, opinion control tower. They gather the opinions of the companies or the companies that are sort of related to doing open source business and they give it to the government and try to uh, 
make it possible for companies to get a better uh, touch of open source. Uh, the government is al always asking what they need more, the companies need more, and the companies are saying they need more uh, subsidiaries in a lot of kinds. So this is how the usual uh, like fast development occurs inside Korea. So based on this, I want to uh, give my, my own future prediction. I think uh, more government action, more government uh, engagement is going to happen in the future because the ultimate goal for the Korean government is overcome technological dependency. Uh, especially uh, what is called the fourth uh, revolution, fourth industrial revolution. Blockchain and AI came out as a hot uh, keyword, those uh, keywords. And the go the Korean government is really thinking that if uh, the Korean government uses or uh, can be able to use these uh, new technologies wisely, it's going to be able to overcome the uh, technological dependency towards other nations. And the current situation, for example, the current uh, situation is the Korean government is really putting emphasis on uh, what is called the open type OS. It's sort it's. Uh, uh, not exactly the same, but very similar to uh, open source software uh, operating system. Uh, Harmonica OS is made by the Ministry of Science and ICT, and it's going to be replacing the Korean military computers, which are over 12,000 PCs uh, by number itself. And it's already, uh, the government is already impl implementing, implementing this uh, plan. And, Another one is Kurum, which means cloud. Kurum OS is developed by the uh, National Security Tech Lab, and it's uh, replacing the uh, post offices, the post services computers already. And also there's a TMAX OS, which is a combination of uh, open source and proprietary software together. And TMAX is also uh, starting to replace a lot of uh, government computers. And Another phase is the Ministry of Interior and Safety, which is like the, to the agency that governs the whole Korean government uh, uh, system. It's, it made a task force uh, several months ago, which is combined of 10 software companies and security IT companies. Uh, the purpose of this uh, task force is to uh, figure out what security threats are going to be in those uh, pre-mentioned uh, OSs that the government uh, created and which uh, the, and the task force is also going to be a, like uh, making efforts to uh, uh, do whatever is more uh, productive or beneficial to the Korean uh, open source uh, community itself. So uh, that was the government side and also the uh, civilian side. Uh, I think it's going to be more active uh, participation. Uh, change in the way of thinking. Uh, in the past, the Korean companies were only uh, focusing their uh, efforts on using it, how to use it more efficiently, and now they learn by experience that other uh, huge companies are not only using it, they're leading the communities. And uh, groups like Samsung, they're trying hard, uh, Tizen, and a lot of other projects but uh, we're not seeing the results uh, as we wanted it to be. So uh, we're just uh, trying to put more efforts in this sector, but still the uh, English, English language is a barrier for the programmers. They are uh, not that much fluent in speaking English, so they have this uh, fear of jumping into the uh, open source communities, but the government is trying to, one of the reasons why they're uh, gathering the programmers and doing an overseas like sightseeing, site visiting is to get rid of that kind of barrier for educational purposes. And the third one is investment in IT ventures, M&A. The pre-existing uh, large IT companies are sort of absorbing the uh, middle or small size companies and they're figuring out, uh, and there's uh, trying to thinking, or started, started to think it, that that's the easiest and fastest way to catch up 
in the fields that uh, they lack expertise in. And uh, a lot of in a lot of times, uh, it's not that successful. But still, these companies are pouring money into these uh, M and A fields. So my conclusion is uh, the South Korean public sector, it's going to be uh, more ours in the Korean term, our term. So the strong government movement to overcome technological dependency is going to like, continue and get stronger and stronger in the future. And heavy investments in new areas. Right now, if you say I have a venture or a venture uh, IT company or I'm going to make one, there's a lot of government money you can just uh, get, get like for just submitting a plan for that. So the Korean uh, government is very eager to get rid of the uh, past uh, like subordinates of the, in technology. And in the private sector, as I said, uh, change in the way of thinking to uh, trying to lead the open source communities is going to be stronger and more IT venture activities is expected in my thought. So that was the uh, short and brief analysis. Any questions? Let us take all the questions. Okay. Well, I have no slides and you've heard enough from me. But it's convenient for me to take off one hat and now put on the hat of uh, India. I am the founder of SFLC.in, but no longer the executive director, uh, which is great because we have a 15 members team and now they can run on their own. Uh, I've been doing this work for quite some time. In 2015, I was in Hong Kong, uh, invited by Asia Society to talk about our work. Uh, obviously, I'm not important, so General Petraeus, David Petraeus, if you're familiar, he was the one who came and gave a, disc gave a talk. And he said, um, mostly on the lines of, this is all nonsense, the next decade or the next two decades don't belong to Asia. They're still in North America. Um, and I was like, maybe General Petraeus wants to know how to actually save his emails and where to act and how to encrypt it. Um, then he wouldn't, also, he wouldn't also be making these predictions about the future. Um, I don't have much numbers, but I can talk a little. It might sound like we've had a lot of success, but we've been at it for a very, very long time. Um, and that's just as um, Kiryong said, and Maggie began with this beautiful slide about culture. Uh, I think uh, we all, at least in Asia, uh, had this great culture of sharing. And uh, so the share and share alike is not a new concept, but like everything else, uh, people from the West come and then tell us, hey, we have a great idea. Basically, it's another recycled idea. But before that, we'd already had uh, the advent of intellectual property, and we'd been told that uh, innovation only happens if you have copyright and patents and soft IP, and, and there's a lot of money. Uh, I was an IP litigator. There is a lot of money in that. Um, and then uh, uh, an open source came. So India's had a very robust open source community. Free Software Foundation uh, India was very active before my time, before I started doing this work. Um, there are many other FSFs in India which are state-wise. Uh, we always win in numbers, so don't be envious. Uh, every time we will quote something, we will always be talking about a much larger population. Um, because that's where a lot of the world lives. So Kerala, uh, where the entire state government runs on free and open source, is only 31 million people. And uh, there are 28 states in India. So um, there's, there's been, as I said, a tradition of uh, free and open source. The community uh, got to it because um, communism is not a bad word in that part of the world still. And, um, and neither is socialism. So a lot of those political parties, those knowledge workers got very attractive to this philosophy. So there's been a very robust um, free and open source software community. Um, I don't think I need to tell you all of your software or back-end offices or even front-end offices, a lot of stuff is being done by us in India. 
So uh, we've been uh, big producers, big users for a very, very long time. Um, I see that these are not my numbers, but 80% of all open source contributions today come from outside of the US. And the top two markets for open source development outside the US are India and China. And the markets are growing at 30% year over year average. Because these numbers are GitHub, you'll obviously trust them. Um, and uh, they're more credible, so that's the numbers we are growing. We see open source everywhere. In fact, Indian government is the only government which has an official policy of um, uh, adopting and making sure in all our contracts, open source is the preferred one. Uh, Red Hat is very, very successful in India. Uh, the first time I saw Red Hat was in uh, Delhi High Court and Supreme Court of India, where all computers were being run by Red Hat. And this is uh, 2001. Sorry, I'm just aging myself. Um, but uh, um, there are various new companies. I think it's an accepted thing that there is no other high quality, cheap raw material like open source provides. All businesses are made on that. Um, uh, this is to our success, I would say. There is no software patents in India. And that's been a big success of um, a communist party, which had um, a, a lot of seats earlier when uh, 2005, before the deadline for TRIPS compliance was running out for us. Uh, there is no software patents uh, in terms of legislation. They're not recognized, they're just pure math. But obviously they're irregularly granted. SFLC.in has challenged several of those. Many of them are still pending, the ones which I filed in 2011, because Accenture has more money, and uh, so does many other people and patent offices run uh, even at a much more sluggish pace than this. But that's not where the fun is, because we are very envious of our neighbors across the Himalayas. So our fun is now about data, and we want to keep everybody out. And that's why data localization is a big, big deal in India. And because we are 1.25 billion people, and when I call for an open chain's first conference meeting, 25 major companies show up, and Reliance Geo already has a plan for it. So who are now big users of open source and uh, understand it and have money to throw at it, but are also very much aware that US can only tell us that $6 billion of the trade is what will be the price if Indian government doesn't take its data localization initiative back. And Indians are like, really? 1.25 billion people and $6 billion? Go home, we're not even talking. But that's, that's where we are moving. Um, there is a ton going on, obviously. Um, it is the most important market for many of uh, big platform companies. Um, they're not allowed in China, so we are the big people. Uh, and uh, India loves using other people's things because we learned it from the best. Most Indians have been trained in the US, so it's good to use everybody's thing, but to your own advantage, um, and that's where we are going. Um, WhatsApp has uh, uh, the largest market. Uh, right now, the number of Indian internet users, and this is mostly mobile, cloud to mobile architecture, not really broadband like it's here, it's 420 million people only. Um, total feature phone users are 950 million. So um, that's the only market we have, that's the market, uh, and that's a big difference. That's why it's attractive. Encryption fights are being fought there, uh, content takedown. Um, uh, like I read somebody, and now I quote all the time, is um, in terms of politics and what companies are doing, and like the theme of the conference, what have we wrought? Uh, India and US are watching the same reality TV. We are just two seasons ahead, both in terms of our politics and both in terms of what the companies have done. And uh, because I'm also the timekeeper, I am going to stop talking. <laughs> Let's do a round of information questions. People want to learn something from the experts before the house. Sam. So, um, the, at least a couple of the speakers were, have been focused very much on the commercial side of things. And at least at the beginning, um, this free software movement actually was a you know, community movement. and. Um, to those who didn't cover it, what's the community aspect? What's it like for the individual developers? How much does this have outs, uh, influence outside 
of the commercial context. Um, I know you did cover it. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I let others speak. Um, it's not a proud thing, but in Korea, most of the developers, they're so busy doing whatever their company uh, work they have. And it's pretty hard to join the uh, international community or pure open source communities, unless it's sort of one way or another related to their actual work. So in the past, uh, the participant rate was really, really low. But now companies like Samsung or LG, they uh, truly uh, get the notion of how important it is to become a member or a participant in the community, inside the community. So they started to create, uh, several, starting from several years ago, they started to create uh, jobs purely open source or purely community participants. and. Those big companies, they have the money and time and manpower to pour in to those uh, actual real open source work. But for little sized companies, uh, I doubt that they have that kind of resource. And the situation hasn't changed that much. And those uh, developers, which are uh, sort of uh, so busy, soaked up with the pre existing work, they're uh, not that active in participating in community works. Uh, that's how I see it. Um, uh, okay, in China, um, things are a little bit complicated. I, I think uh, the mm, community is still um, more on the well, commercial company side instead of uh, individual developers. Um, I think uh, you know, China has been developing so fast and uh, uh, young people um, feel it's hard to survive in big cities, but the only big cities offer uh, good job opportunities. So they, um, they are fighting hard to get good jobs with uh, companies. Um, and they don't, a lot of developers don't really um, want to contribute either because they are with this company and the company has a policy uh, that you can't contribute to the com community or um, they, uh, even if they are individual developers, some of them are students, they, they, um, they, they can do it as a hobby but only probably for a short period of time and they want to move to commercial companies. India is much more uplifting. Uh, I have to say that is because Free Software Foundation India existed, SFLC.in has existed for a very long time. We have a lot of Debian con contributors. Our current CTO is um, uh, very actively involved. The one before was in the Mozilla community. Um, I think there's a lot of pride in um, being able to contribute to any of the projects. And um, it's not that we don't have the gender imbalance or diversity problem, but it's not like in the US. Uh, in India, obviously our choices are doctors or engineers or software developers, whether you're a boy or a girl. So we, uh, we do pretty well there. And, um, uh, and there are a lot of avenues. I don't think enough because I don't think it's ever enough uh, until we actually reach numbers which are perhaps better than anywhere else. But uh, there are regular events. There is a lot of support. Um, there is um, uh, state support, not so much. But I would say that um, there are definitely either corporate support or community support itself. They are sometimes at institutions who have believed in this for a very long time. Or they are political party support, as I said, knowledge workers are organized and they do believe in this very much so. The Freedom Box Foundations, um, the project in Andhra Pradesh, which is actually a completely Microsoft captured uh, uh, state for a very long time, but has seen s such great development. And that's not because of companies, that's mostly because the community believes in it. And the ethos are so important that uh, I'm sure 
some of you who've been coming to this conference have heard Evan many a time to talk about um, uh, Ambedkar Computer Community Center. This is a community center based in a slum in Bangalore uh, behind IBM's office where uh, um, engineers who work in these big companies, all of your companies, who have spent uh, their evenings and their weekends building a community of kids who would have never found any other way of life if it was not for free and open source software. It's, um, uh, I, I used to tell Evan, you're the white man who just gets emotional about everything. That's not how we do it. But I understand that community, how much it teaches not only itself, but everybody else also. Just the power of sharing and learning. Uh, Nagarjuna, who is the chairperson of Free Software Foundation, is a, re is a professor at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Um, I also will say that uh, I've had the privilege of getting all the Free Software Foundation big giants in India to sit on SFLC.ins board, which is, uh, which is a great thing. And a lot of them are members or contributors. And, but he always says, I've seen him sit on the floor and start teaching people that free and open source is about teaching and making things together. So I definitely feel very much more encouraged in terms about people, community, and the philosophy of freedom. And I must say um, that has also given way to the larger movement of internet freedom, which is not going to be possible without free and open source. And the point about freedom is uh, now can be underscored much more than just show me the code. Uh, I just want to add one more thing regarding Korea. I spoke to Dark about Korea, but I also see a bright future regarding the younger generations, which are students and youngsters who are growing up like uh, in elementary school or middle school. They're due to the internet and GitHub and every like open uh, software, uh, a lot of young people inside Korea, there's a uh, coding fever. So a lot of people are sort of trying to or starting to uh, do coding. And in colleges, there are a lot of open source uh, lectures uh, being uh, taught. And among those young people, I also see a bright side inside Korea, even though the current situation is not ideal from my viewpoint. So I say uh, the situation, I hope, and also the situation is going to uh, get better inside Korea. Hi, thank you. Um, that was really fascinating. I myself grew up in Korea, actually, primarily. Um, so, you know, this is a fresh, and I've been to this conference multiple times, so I think this perspective was long overdue, <laughs> I want to say. But um, all said, you know, obviously, I think in, in the regions that you guys are representing, um, open source perhaps is relatively still at its nascent stage in trying to, you know, if we have to have a narrative about it. but. Um, uh, that said, you know, what's interesting for me is growing up, I, be, I feel like the big vision and movement was to respect IP, right? So we've been educated and trained to enforce IP, respect it, and this open source in some ways it's saying, all right, well, revert back to whatever you guys were doing, right? It, I'm overly simplifying it, of course, but obviously there is that tension that between the two philosophies, I think that we all acknowledge. And, you know, here we went through the conversation, through the evolution of its development, et cetera. And I think there is a community based sort of negotiation mechanism that helps us to, like, we don't have to go to enforcement, hopefully, as much, right, of things, um, of licenses. We could just potentially have a, con a conversation about it if there are issues arising from it because there are institutions in place of sort. Um, that said, you know, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, from Korea, like a government-based approach, you know, where it's more of a government top-down promotion. Um, and obviously each of the different communities have their own institutions that are different from here. So, you know, what sort of, enforce not enforcement, but in mediating potential conflicts in the future between OSS and proprietary as the communities know of, who do you think would be the key players in mediating potential tensions and conflicts there? In each of your communities. 
like would it be the government would it be corporate based you know standard oriented or you know well i think in china at least uh the community itself um is uh, where um you can you know you can um enforce uh, your rights. It's not like a legal system. It's just uh, people, uh, companies care about their uh, integrity and they care about uh, whether um, you know they have a, a good name in the community because they want to attract uh, more developers to join their projects or they want to attract talents to join the company. You know, so I think the community itself plays uh, the most important role. As I said, there, uh, in, uh, we don't see litigations about uh, open source in China. So uh, I, I don't see any other way to enforce it. And, and if you, you're in China, you know that if, if you want to enforce your uh, rights in commercial software, it's difficult already. Well, if we're doing our job right, then obviously it's not going to court, but that doesn't always happen. <laughs> um, I, I won't say that there has, there's not been a case so far, which is good. If there had been, we would be there, considering we are always in court, and that's the place we feel more comfortable. Um, but uh, there are also quite a lot community efforts. When um, I helped keep get OIN in India five, six years ago, the idea was exactly this, to explain to them there's an alternative way of doing this. You don't have to go through the same process. Patent pooling works. In fact, he met the equivalent of the PTO head in India who wanted to come up with his own patent pool for other such stuff. India also has a very interesting thing called open drug discovery uh, because for the large pharmaceutical corporations, our diseases are not sexy. There are, Evan says, 10 drugs for Alzheimer's in dogs. I haven't confirmed that fact. But, uh, but uh, malaria, tuberculosis, these are third world diseases. But Open Drug Discovery did this for those kind of diseases, tuberculosis mostly, where the same ethos were taken and then transferred. Um, so if, for enforcement, I would say, um, again, it will be the copyright law and uh, the courts are going to look up to what's happening. In terms of software patents, we've had equivalent of re-examinations for sure. Some of them, uh, actually all of them brought, uh, brought by us. The other things were just to come up with data about what were these patents being granted. Um, uh, we've had quite a lot of success at the policy level, at executive and the, uh, not, we don't have to go to the legislative level. Um, one of the current equivalent circuit court judges who was a lawyer that time um, also called me a traitor to my own IP community because I had done this in a newspaper, which was fun. Uh, so um, I, you can never guarantee who's going to go to court. And, uh, but the idea is there is a place, there are, in India at least, there are institutions. There's OIN, there's SFLC.IN, there is FSF. People, uh, have at least some history and a lot of people from uh, India do travel and do talk about these issues um, and as you see um, we do have access to everything and that's why we talk too much so <laughs> uh, I just want to explain the Korean situation as you said uh, the Korean situation is a lot, affected a lot by the government compared to other countries. And I don't think, in my opinion, there's not a single like most important factor that's going to affect the enforcement problems or uh, like later on make it more important or, or less important. Because if the court gives out a sample case which is going to be like, which is very strong in its uh, result or heavy heavy in imposing some kind of penalty, the whole uh, open source community or company, private companies are going to move. If the government sets out a strong movement, the private sector is going to move also. If the uh, conglomerate, Chebors, they move, Samsung, LG, they move in a direction, it's going to be a huge movement also. Because as I said, a lot of uh, small size companies are sort of getting the works from those uh, huge companies and 
in that sense, I see a bright future in some like movements that are uh, getting started in uh, world uh, worldwide world worldwidely getting started. For example, Open Chain. Uh, I see a very big and good opportunity, which a lot of companies are going to be able to lower the cost of compliance and get much, much less uh, risk compared to the past. And uh, I think in Korea, those uh, several, like a lot of other factors are going to affect. For example, foreign enforcement organizations, they can also uh, like make choices or put the, uh, control the level of how enforcement is going to be uh, done inside Korea. So it's going to be not only one uh, main player, it's going to be a lot of other players. So. Let me make one quick comment in closing to address your point from a different direction. What happened here, and I don't just mean here in North America, also to a significant extent here in Western Europe, what happened in that broad West was that the civil society determination to make software by learning how to make software, that is the relationship between young people's learning activity and the resulting software was the driver of everything that happened whether it was Linus Torvalds in a dorm room in Finland or it was MIT as a hub of software learning, engineering, and making, whether it was the forms of technological education at Stanford University that led to the spin-outs of the great platform giants of Northern California, the root of the activity in creation was young people learning. What you have seen in all the discussion that we had here is how different that is from much of the environment to the East. Mishi's point about the relationship between teaching and software learning in India is to my mind crucial. There is the one place where civil society originates software learning as a form of individual human growth and businesses come along. Whether in China or in Korea, or if we had been talking about the Japanese situation, we would have discovered that that process was reversed. That industry took up the need for the software, whether as user or as contributor, as profiteer, as national champion, and the resulting job market activity that begins to have some effect on how education is conducted. When I was working as an advisor to Samsung SDS through, through all the good work that Kiryong did in order to help us uh, adapt ourselves to Korean circumstances, I watched a company which had been making essentially Java middleware for Samsung Group for 10 years begin to cope with the fact that it was going to need a ton of Python programmers for things that they wanted to do. And I said to them, yeah, that's really going to be a big problem because you don't have any Python programmers because nobody teaches people how to program in Python in Korea. And as Kiryong rightly pointed out, young people didn't do things that weren't going to lead directly to employment. The consequence was that business itself began to shape the market in ideas and for labor in directions which came, whether from business first or from government first, from old people first. So I will tell you what I think the real question of the future of free software in those parts of Asia is. The question is, how can we make the children the leaders? How can we make the process an education first process, which is how the culture changes? We face different obstacles. What Kiryon has said about the importance of government influence throughout the economy means that government will try from a top-down point of view to determine what children learn and how they go about understanding the technology of their world and they will mostly succeed. What Maggie has told you is that the Chinese Communist Party's way of ruling China depends upon closing access to certain kinds of knowledge and depends upon an assumption about what civil society can do, which requires the leadership of the Communist Party before civil society can do anything. 
One of the most difficult parts of my relationship with the Chinese government over the last several years has been the difficulty of coming to a discussion about how we make free software in the West. Because it is ideologically difficult to have a conversation with the Chinese Communist Party's leadership over the fact that we make software in vast, unhierarchical arrangements of young people working together by pure cooperation with no hierarchical control. To the extent that the party understands that that is how it works, they don't want to admit to the understanding, and they certainly don't want to reproduce the understanding. The idea of large, technologically powerful, enabled bunches of thousands of young people working together without hierarchical control is not on their list of things to do today. This is a cultural question. These are all cultural questions. What Mishi says about the nature of the relationship between workers who grew up in the slums in Kerala or in Tamil Nadu and who now work as remittance workers in Karnataka and how they understand what it means to give knowledge back to the people in communities like those they come from is absolutely constitutive of Indian technological culture. It's the reason why in Kerala, the only place in the world I ever go where there are signs on the telephone poles along the road advertising for PHP and C++ programmers. Because if you want a programmer who knows PHP or C++, just put a sign on the side of the road because everybody's learning it. In Kerala, the concepts of free software begin at age six in the schools. The teaching of free software as the technological material of learning begins in fifth grade. If we want the whole of the human race to benefit from what we did, we have to reproduce that understanding. And in doing so, as both Maggie and Kiryong have shown, we have to encounter cultural and political obstacles which are unique to the situations in which we find them. Every time we have this conversation, and I promise you, we're not going to go another year without having this conversation. We're always going to be having this conversation. And every year we do it, we are going to be addressing in different contexts the sociological and cultural differences in societies which determine how they use and understand free software and how much the word freedom matters, and how much the word software matters, and how much the words economic development matter, and how much the words human development matter. Mishi is correct to point out that the core of Freedom Box development has been in Hyderabad these last four years, partly through funding from a Western technology company, ThoughtWorks, and partly because the young men who came to it, and the young women too, came to it through their desire for human capital improvement, the improvement of their skills, the improvement of their ability to raise and help their communities. This, where we started in our own little suburb of the human race, this place where we started is where they have to end. We are reversing processes of development that we took for granted and trying to do that in a way which puts our knowledge at other people's service without putting our culture at their subordination is the great task of the free software movement in the 21st century. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to keep moving so that we can get on.